Uh, let's see. Yes, we are live. All righty. Are you recording these, by the way, mate? Uh, no. Oh, well, it is on, on YouTube. So it, sh it is, it, it will be recorded on YouTube. So it's there. No, I think you're on live, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, it's too late. Oh, no. Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry about uh, my brother's misbehaving. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, so welcome to the uh, Kindle uh, talk show, whatever it's called. I don't know the name of this live show yet, but all right and if you guys have questions please uh write down those um questions here and as you know we have alex bennett sensei here with us today thank you for being with us sensei. hey you're welcome since when have you ever called me sensei before hero yeah i'm just being <laughs> polite bro <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we had uh, questions last time as well, but we had so many questions and we don't even know what to pick. So if you guys have questions, please go ahead and start writing down. So how's your um, uh, online online Keiko going? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, going very well, I think. I mean, uh, I can't speak for everybody else, but we get, a good, we get a good number every day. And, you know, between 30 and sometimes up to, I think the highest we've been up to is 80 so far. Wow. Um, and uh, if anything, um, I think I might have mentioned this last time, but uh, it's really, it's getting me out of bed in the morning as well. <laughs> You know, um, it's so hard to remain motivated right at the moment. And I'm sure a lot of people sort of know what I'm what I'm getting at here. But uh, especially now, Hiro, um, today would have been the last day of the Kyoto Taikai in, oh. uh, in Kyoto, right? And today oh. I would have come back after watching a whole lot of Hanshi Hachidan um, beat the crap out of each other. And yeah. I would have come home rather, uh, well, infused with enthusiasm and would be wanting to get back out into the dojo as quickly as possible tomorrow right. for example but right, uh, right. this golden week which is you know it's the it's the, the biggest kendo festival of the year in japan uh i was supposed to do a hachidan grading i was supposed to do my tachi eye at the at the taikai oh and it's, it's when you get to meet you know uh people from all around the country because they all come to kyoto and uh, say good day so it's your yearly sort of thing right right and of course of of course that didn't happen this year so it's yeah it's been in that sense there's something really missing right right and right. it's times like this that it really you know kicks in and it's like ah oh, right. geez and so this this asa geko uh, virtual keko doing in the morning um has been a for for me personally it's been a bit of a um a lifesaver in a way if it was just me um it would be double the effort to get out there and do it on your own but because there's a whole lot of people here with you um it's fun and uh you know the time goes so quickly right. you know one one hour and 10 minutes is about the average time i think and it's just like bang so doing it five times a week at the moment and um yes yeah, it's, it's great really good 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 so, so yeah <clears throat> uh that reminded me that you were going for eighth down for the first time right yep so how how, how do you feel i interviewed you uh 10, 10 years ago yep. right after you passed your seventh time mm -hmm. your first attempt mm -hmm. and of course you had 10 years to practice to polish up your uh Kindle clean up my act <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and so did you what do you have any changes in you and it's hard for you probably to notice but you know i always thought like 
I don't even know what they're saying. The eighth down sense is saying when you do, when you, you know, when they do kinder. Mm. You know, how can they grasp this hint of us going forward with something? You know, whatever they they kind of get in. Do you have any changes? Do you realize any changes in kinder in your kinder? Yeah. Um... I have to be careful how I say this because I, I don't want to come across being really disrespectful or rude or arrogant or anything like that. But you know, I've done I've done my time, right? And you know, over the last ten years since passing Nana Dan, of course, you think about Hachi Dan. You think about what is it that makes you know what is it that's so different? What is it that I should be aspiring to? Um, but I've always been doing that ever since I started Kendo. So mm. in that sense, it hasn't been much different. But ten years in the future, there's this uh, this milestone of Hachidan. It's always been on my mind. Ten years became one year very quickly. One year became no years very quickly. And it's like bloody hell. Where did all the time go? Yeah, <laughs> just like that. Um, but what I've been I mean, every because because you have this goal. Um, over the last ten years, I've had, you know, one epiphany, or one eu eureka moment, uh, almost every week or every month. Something suddenly makes sense, and it's like, ah, naru hodo. That's what I should be doing, and it's not one suddenly you become enlightened and then you know everything at all but because you are focused on this goal way ahead in the future um you take every lesson that you do every careful that you go, do quite seriously and you get something out of it and you know my my kendo my way of thinking about kendo has changed a lot in the in the last 10 years um in that Ironically, in a way, um, it, it's become deeper and deeper. And the one thing I can say is that, wow, there is so much more that I don't understand now mm -hmm. because of it. Because I can actually see that there is, there is a, a realm which I'm trying to break through into and what i can see by interacting with other with you know with the hachidan sense is that even though they have broken through that realm there's another realm that they're trying to break through to and so i would say this there are hachidan sensei and there are hachidan sensei so pinkiri ということ okay so there are some hachidan senseis who are at this level and there are some Hachidan senses who are at this level, and there's some Hachidan senses who God knows what level they're at. And so one thing I've learned is Hachidans are not gods. <laughs> okay. It is a number. Okay. Really? And and of course it's it's a number that you know everybody, especially specialists in Japan, the police and so forth, they all want to get because it's uh, it's the icing on the cake of a lifetime of, of hard training. Um, but what I have, I have learned is that, you know, just thinking about that number only is quite superficial in many ways. Um, because once you get it, well, it's not as if it finishes. <laughs> right. Right. It's like like a PhD in a way. It's like when I started out doing a PhD, I thought, "Oh my God, PhD is so amazing! It's so, it's so cool! It's so awesome! If I get that, that'll be amazing." Um, but when you actually get the PhD, you realise it's just the beginning, and just because you have a PhD doesn't mean to say that that's the be all and end all. It really is the beginning of an academic career, and so I was lucky I didn't fall into the trap thinking that. A PhD would be is, is just so awesome that probably I don't even deserve it um, because as soon as you start thinking that then you probably won't get it so with regard to Hachidan 
the biggest change, and I know this is a very long answer, the biggest change is I've stopped looking at the Hachidan and the people who have it as anything special. Um, there are some incredibly special senses out there, um, which, like I said, they're in a completely different realm altogether. But with Hachidan, where I'm at at the moment, Hachidan is a technical grade. Okay, mm -hmm. it's, a, um, it's not a, uh, a thing that's given to you as an, as an honorific uh, grade or anything like that. It's like you have to show that you have the technical ability and also uh, you exude the confidence or the kigurai um, that is expected of somebody with that, with that level. And so when I was supposed to sit Hachidan on May the 2nd, uh, my attitude was that I'm going there to pass the damn thing. Um, because if I wasn't ready to pass it, I wouldn't sit it. And so uh, what has changed in the last 10 years? Well, Hachidan is not such a, uh, what can you say? Um, the holy grail any to me it's just another thing that i've got to knock off and whether i do or not <laughs> the reality is that you know the pass rate is so ridiculously small you know, 0 like, 0.3 0 0.4 yeah i mean but having said that if you think that because of that you're not good enough and you'll never get it then why bother right okay so i've actually what I've been working on in the last 10 years is to overcome that complex and actually uh, believe that uh, come what may, if I sit a Hachidan exam, I will pass it because that's the level of my kendo anyway. Um, so the last 10 years has been really about building confidence and breaking down uh, these or well, a strange aura of impossibility. Mm. And so if you're going to sit it, bloody well, pass the mm -hmm. damn thing. <laughs> you know, that's the attitude I have, and that's the attitude that will keep me going until I change my attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when you said uh, like when you went uh, for the uh, symphony the exam, it's like, oh, it's a matter of us, I'll just give it a go. As a, when I pass, I pass. When I fail, then I fail. And the fail just fails. So it was quite a different attitude in it, mm. in this sense, you know, because now you go, oh, I'm going to sit there and then just pass. It's, it's really, really different. <laughs> well, one way or another, one way or another, I will pass it. Mm. Right, um, correct. And there's so, no such a thing that if you do this, oh, well, if you're convinced, I mean, if you do certain things that convince your, uh, the, those judges, you will pass. But there are no such things techniques that you know you have to show to the uh judges so it's pretty it's it's about what you can show and confidence and then here my kendo you judge kind of thing isn't it really yeah well if i don't believe in it then the shinsayin will not believe in it either right. true that's very true it's as simple as that really right so whether they, I believe in it, whether they believe in it, I don't know, but I've got to somehow make them believe in it. <laughs> it's, it's my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because uh, and all of a sudden, there is no uh, comments coming in. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What, are you guys still there? <laughs> yeah, that was a bit of a boring answer, wasn't it, really? Sorry about that, man. <laughs> I'm still a little bit down in the dumps that i wasn't able to go and give it a go yeah, on, yeah on that's a bit, yeah, pity wasn't it yeah yeah but it's a bright side is you have another year or or so so that's pretty good well yeah. i hope it's not another year man jeez yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh there's another can you see that oh uh, yeah um yeah so if nihon kendo kata is it possible to trace each cutter back to its original Koryu technique? <sighs> some of them, yes. And some of them, it's a little bit, a little bit hazy or a little bit, uh, 
a little bit difficult. I wish I had my book with me, actually. Um, if you look at the uh, the people who were in the committee that created the Nihon Kendo Kata in 1912, um, they were all masters from some traditional style of Kenjutsu. There was a number of them, but five in particular, uh, like Takanosa Saburo and um, Negishi and all those guys. And, and if you look at their uh, schools, where they come come from, like uh, uh, Onohai Toryu, there was a Jikshin Kageryu uh, teacher in there as well, um, and Shingyo Toryu from memory, and a couple of others. I, I can't remember offhand. Um, but uh, if you look at the schools that they came from, then you can get an idea of where the influences for the Kendo Kata came from. However, right. obviously, they're not exactly the same Kata as they are in the Koryu um they've been adapted and changed to make or to suit a new modern style of kendo rather than kenjutsu for the uh for the school system um so there as far as i know there are about five possibly different kodus sort of mixed into uh into the kendo kata uh, interestingly also i had no idea about this but i do uh tendo ryu Naginata. And Tendoryu also has Kenjutsu Kata, which most people have never seen. Many people don't even believe that they exist. <laughs> and they think that somebody made them up and they're a whole lot of crap, but um, they do. <laughs> and I've been uh, practicing them with uh, some of my Tendoryu buddies. Um, and in the, ken uh, the Tendoryu Kenjutsu, there's one Kata that is exactly the same as number four in oh. kendo kata exactly the same so like uchidachi skis to the to the um to the chest and shidachi not that we call it shidachi does the old ukenagashi uh, and strike to, the, strike to the man right so i look at that and i think wow is this was this incorporated into the kendo kata uh from tendoryu well i don't know um because i doubt if there were too many people involved with Tendoryu at the time, but I don't think there they were. Yeah. No. So in any case, uh, you can some of them, but not all of them. And even if you could, they're very different to their original forms. Um, but having said that, uh, the, some of the philosophical elements are still sort of retained within. Uh, but again, they are not to be found anywhere in any of the official um, explanations. Uh, by the Zen Nihon Kendo Remme. And so you really have to do a lot of research into historical documents of a hundred years ago to find out what these guys were thinking when they made the kata to know what they actually mean and where they came from. Um, and not many people do that anymore. Right, right. And so, uh, you know, the, the Inoue Sensei gave us uh, the reason, not, not the reason, the meaning behind the kata number one, number two, number three. Yep. Right, and is that his interpretation or is that that? Because <laughs> we have no no instruction manual about mm. why we're doing this, the yep. reason behind this and that. Right? Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. One, it's all it's all become just doing the movements right, and where's your little pinky, and where's your little right. finger, you know, little toe, and all the rest of it, right? Um, in always sense says interpretation is based on many, many years of rigorous study of the documents. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's a little bit of poetic license mm -hmm. in Inoue Sensei's interpretation. But uh, having said that, it's not something he made up. It's something, it's conclusions that he came, uh, came to through all of his research. And you remember that he used to be the head of the Kata Committee at the All Japan Kendo Federation as well. Right, right. But but you won't find his uh, interpretations written in any official documentation for the All Japan Kendo Federation. They sort of move away from that kind of thing because it gets a little bit too, well, pseudo religious or <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> a little bit a little bit too spiritual, perhaps. Right, and right. the Zen Kenden is really not about that. It's about doing 
can my fingers go in there? Correct, Kendo. Right. Um, and making sure it really does the kihon correctly. It doesn't really want to go too much into a, yeah, the philosophical uh, underpinnings or interpretations of what Kendo is because that sort of thing's been changing over the generations and over the centuries right. anyway. So, and uh, yeah, uh, a lot of uh, books says kata number one through one, two, three is like ten chi jin and something like that. And then now jin is a hito, right? The person. Mm. Uh, oh no, ten chi jin. And it, apparently Tokyo and Osaka, mm. jin can be chudan and jin can be geran or something like that. Some book says that. <laughs> so well, what that is um, is before uh the nihon kendo kata was created mm. in 1912 there was an earlier version um okay. that was made uh by the dai nippon butokukai yeah. i think it was 1906 from memory and it was called the dai nippon teiko kenjutsu no kata or something like that yeah and there was only three there was only right. three kata and they were ten chi jing Right. Oh, well, that's where it came from then, eh? Yeah, the problem <laughs> is with that is the person that made it, it was a guy called Watanabe. Um, he was a bit of a controversial figure. And uh -huh. the kata that he created, he created them, well, they made a committee at the Daini Pompudokai, which was the sort of like the overseer for martial arts in Japan at the time. They made a committee and they came up with these three kata to introduce into the schools around Japan so that they could uh, make some kind of standardized teaching menu. Um, but the kata that they created, the three, uh, Ten Chi Jing, were very kind of abstract. And for example, uh, the kamai that they had, they called it Seigan or Chudan, but actually there was Hasso. And it was all like really, this is not orthodox kenjutsu kata in any way whatsoever it's very weird and it wasn't very popular and uh because of that they threw it away they said no 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 we're going to make another one and a few years later in 1912 uh, a few of the experts from the daini pompadokukai and also from the tokyo koto shihangakko which is in scuba mm -hmm. university now uh, uh under the auspices of the ministry of education came together and made uh, a new set of kata and they started off with those three um, that we do now. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, they call it Dai, dai Ippon, was it? Well, dai Ichi, Dai Nihon, Dai, uh, dai Ni, Dai San. We call them Ippon Me, Nihon Me, Sanbon Me. Yeah? Um, and then they added the others later on. Um, so it was kind of like a piecemeal process. But the one you're talking about was one that was a set of cutter that was created earlier that caused a hell of a lot of confusion. And evidently, it's causing a bit of confusion now too. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, the more you study, you just go, it's go, why these two, you know, different versions and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah It's exactly. really, yeah, confusing actually. Okay, uh, the show has, there you go. Oh, okay. Um, all right, um, I'm going to, because uh, Shaw asked this last time, um, I sort of dug out the stuff that I had, and I'm just going to um, share the screen with everybody here. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, share screen. One share. Oh, it says that Chrome has a bug that can cause screen sharing to crash in Windows 10. <laughs> it's pretty rare, but if it happens, you may want to use Firefox. Okay, let's see what happens. Hopefully, it won't crash. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Yeah, well, not if it happens, right? So, whoa, okay. what's happened? What's happened? Some weird stuff's happened. Here we go. Yeah, right. All right, can, can you see this? So I just okay. Sure, I'm gonna hide your question. There you go. Can you can you see this on the, on your screen? I can see that, and uh, let me check. Yep. Everybody see that? Um, this is out of uh, a recent book that I published called Bushido Explained. And is it available on Amazon. Yes, it is. <laughs> there of you course. go. People. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll show you in a second. But 
this whole idea of setsunin to and katsu, well, I've got here katsu jin, but another way of reading it is katsu nin ken. In fact, I think katsu nin is probably more correct, but it's more widely known as katsu jin. And basically, this, um, this can explain the progression of the Nihon Kendo Kata, uh, especially one, two, three, if you use uh, Inoue Sensei's interpretation. So, in other words, if you think about the Kendo Kata, uh, Kihon, uh, not Kihon, um, uh, Ippome, both people go into Jordan and then they go forward and Uchitachi tries to cut Shidachi in the head and through their body. Um, of course, if that happened, then Shidachi would be dead pretty quickly, right? But Shidachi moves out of the way and then does basically men nuki men. And so finishes with a, with a cut to the head. So in theory, uh, Uchitachi is dead as a doorknob, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because he's had his head cut open. Uh, so this is like the most basic level in Kenjutsu, in Kendo. What we are doing is we're learning how to use, well, in theory, at least, we're lose, using, sorry, learning how to use swords so that we can strike the other person. Right. So again, in theory, if we hit somebody in the men with the shinai, we're hitting them in the head with a katana. And that's why they always say it's really important to get the first strike in more than anything else, right? What happens after that doesn't matter. Well, it sort of does, but not as much as the first, the shodachi, right? Right. So this is the most fundamental, the most basic level of kendo. Um, it's kill or be killed. Of course, it's not that now in that you're not going to die if somebody hits you in the head with a shinai. But right. when you think about the philosophical underpinnings of kendo where it came from this is where it came from the first stage in your study of kenjutsu was to learn how to kill somebody because right. if you didn't then somebody was going to kill you so this first stage is very much uh what would be considered setsuninto okay and this concept it wasn't it didn't come in uh in the book heho kadensho for the first time it was actually more of a zen concept that had been around since probably i don't know the 16th century but it was in the 1630s when yagyu munenori wrote his book for the shogun it was called heho kadensho and in it he included uh two chapters on setsuninto and katsunin ken and so setsuninto is what i have just explained to you it is the very fundamental level of using a sword to kill, kill or be killed. And that is why it is called setsunin to, or the death dealing blade. Now it's very important here. Can you see my cursor, Hiro? Yeah, I can see. Yep. Yeah. So it's very important here to notice the kanji that is being used for setsunin to is katana. Okay. Now, katana, if we look at the katana, the picture here, its characteristic is that it has a curved blade and it also has a single cutting edge. Okay? So a single cutting edge means that it's one-way traffic. When you use the katana, okay, you are using it to cut your enemy. Okay? And... This is kind of semantic in a way, but this use of the kanji is really important. And the reason why is, let's think about kata nihomme. And kata nihomme is uh, Uchitachi goes in to strike uh, or to cut Shidachi's kote. Okay, Shidachi moves out of the way 
avoids the cut and then returns the attack and strikes Kote, the wrist. But when you think about it, Shidachi has a really big opportunity to strike Uchitachi's head for the second cutter as well. Why don't they strike the head? Good I mean, when we do when we do normal kendo with their bogu on, if somebody strikes kote, we often do kote nuki man, right? right? Not many people do kote nuki kote, mm -hmm. do they? So why do why do we strike kote? This is this is a really important point. You could strike man. If you strike man, that means that uchidachi would be dead, just like an ip. And you have plenty of opportunity to do that, but you don't. You strike kote instead. You strike their wrist, which still hurts. Okay, you get your your arm chopped off. Yeah. Okay, but you're probably not going to die as long as the blade is not too dirty <laughs> <laughs> or rusty, and you've had your tetanus yeah. shot. Okay. <laughs> Um, so what that does, it doesn't necessarily kill your opponent, who's attacked you first, by the way, but you have stopped them from being able to fight you anymore. You haven't killed them, but you've stopped them. And so that is kind of between Setsuninto and Katsujinken, or Katsuninken, right? And then we, if you look at Kihon, uh, Gomen, sorry, Kihon Jana, Kata, Sambome, number three. Okay. Uh, Uchitachi and Shidachi go into Gedan and they approach each other and they lift their swords up slowly, lifting them up. And then uh, Uchitachi tries to thrust Tsuki at Shidachi. Um, right, right in the, uh, the soft part of the chest, right? The solar plexus. Shidachi receives the thrust and nullifies it and then thrusts back to bah, bah, bah. but in the sambome kata even though shidachi ends up winning actually the sword does not make contact with uchitachi at all right. it's thrusting and it goes from the chest up to between the eyes, but it stops there. If Uchitachi was to make a move, then Shidachi could kill Uchitachi very easily, very quickly by thrusting in the face, right? right. Um, but that doesn't happen because Uchitachi thinks, holy crap, this is not good. Hey, man, are we cool? And then... Shidachi goes, yeah, all right. And Shidachi starts to retreat, and then they both go back to the middle, and not a drop of blood has been spilled. Now, this is kind of representative of the ideal of katsuninken, or katsujinken, life-giving sword. In order to get to that level, you have to learn how to kill. And once you have learned the skills, uh, you have the, the heart uh, to withstand the the pressure and the fear, you have the valor and you have the technical ability to defeat your opponent, you get yourself in a situation where you defeat your opponent, but you don't kill them. You defeat them without, without shedding any blood at all. Now, this is considered the highest level to be able to win without, ultimately, without even drawing your sword. So Katsuninken is called the life-giving sword because it still wields authority. It is still strong. It still cannot be defeated. And it got to that position through the various stages of your shugyo, of your training. But uh, ultimately, it is not to make the situation worse, but to bring order to the chaos. And that's Interestingly, why, even though we use a shinai in kendo, shinai is written with the two kanji, bamboo, katana. 
Okay, so we're essentially using a bamboo katana, a katana in kendo. So why do we call it kendo instead of todo or katanado? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the reason why is because a katana or a to and a ken are different. They're different in in shape, but more importantly, they're different philosophically. A katana, as I said before, is one cutting edge. It's one way. You're using it to kill your opponent. The other side of the katana is blunt. If you hit yourself on the head with it, nothing's going to happen. But a ken actually comes from the Taoist ideals of uh, uh, and originally uh, ken or tsurugi were used in, in religious rituals and Taoist rituals on ceremonies for, for many, many centuries uh, before swords even came to Japan. And the characteristic, characteristic of a ken, the same ken that we use in kendo, this ken here, is that it has a cutting edge on both sides, right? So that means that when you hold the ken, one blade is pointing towards your enemy. But because of the shape of the weapon, one blade is also pointing at you. And even if you try or you think to cut down the evil in the enemy, you must also be aware that before you cut down the evil in the enemy, there is evil inside you as well. And so to kill anything or anybody is, in fact, against kendo or the way of heaven, according to the Taoist ideals and the ideals that were introduced into, into Tokugawa period Kenjutsu. Uh, it is necessary sometimes, but ultimately, if at all possible, more than killing the enemy, one must be ready to chastise or cut away the evil that resides within yourself. It is a way of purging yourself of hypocrisy. And even though you might have the ability and the skill to kill somebody with your blade, having that ability and choosing not to use it is the ultimate uh, objective of the way of the sword. And that's why instead of Tordo, it's called kendo, because even though we're using a katana, what we're aspiring to is use of a ken or a tsurugi, and that the ultimate goal is not to kill the enemy, but really to better yourself as a human being. So this is uh, why this idea of setsunin to katsunin ken um, is very important in modern kendo, and why we call it kendo and not todo, even though... Probably most, most people have never really heard that explanation before. Um, that was pretty long, really, wasn't it? Sorry about that, Hiro. No worries. I was intensely listening. <laughs> did you see the graphic? Yeah, I did. I did see it, and I'm sure that uh, was also saw it. And also, the probably uh, that's why now uh, the sword, the du double-edged sword, is yep. one of the uh, three treasures in the royal family in Japan, I think. Uh, you mean Kusanagi no Tsurugi? Kusanagi no Tsurugi, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. indeed. That's, well, it's not because, but it was... Do you know the story of Kusanagi no Tsurugi? Oh, here's a guy, big bang. <laughs> Long story short, bang, damn. <laughs> do you know what the story is? Yes, yeah, good. Don't. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Susano no Oh gosh. Yeah. It's Am Amaterasu Omikami's yeah. younger brother. So, the sun goddess, younger brother, right? He was the god of storms, and he was a naughty god. One day. Um, he pissed his sister off big time and he was banished from the heavens 
and he came down to earth and he found an old lady and an old man crying and he said why are you crying and they said well every year yamata no orochi the eight headed serpent comes down from the mountains and takes away one of our daughters and this year we only have one daughter left and he's going to come and he's going to take her away and then we'll have nobody and he said oh no that's terrible this is susano the god right he said this is terrible um let me help you and if i succeed in killing yamata no orochi then i get to marry your daughter <laughs> okay wow. dirty kami naughty kami and so what he did because yamato no orochi has eight heads he got eight big barrels of sake all right and so, so when yamata no orochi comes down from from the mountains he finds these eight barrels of sake and he drinks them so he got completely pissed off his eight heads right i think it was a friday night too from memory and, <laughs> and anyway when yamata no orochi was drunk uh, susano uh, who had another sword called totsuka no tsurugi or the ten handled tsuka he jumped on uh, yamata no orochi and chopped off its heads killed it and when it was hacking when he was hacking away at one of the tails he heard this sound in the in the tail is like metal bashing on metal mm -hmm. right and so he thought wow what's that and he digs it out of the tail and he finds this beautiful sword well i don't i don't i don't know that part <laughs> yeah right and so this this beautiful sword uh what was it called murakumo no tsurugi originally because it was named after the uh the cloud that was always around yamato orochi's head and hmm. so he took this this sword and he gave it back to his older sister in heaven and she came out of the cave and suddenly the universe was light again and he gave it to her to say sorry sorry sis because i was such a bad kami and a few generations later amaterasu omikami uh sent the sword back down to earth to one of her descendants ninigi no mikoto who was uh grandson great grandson who was going down to earth to try and colonize the earth right and it sort of stayed there it was given to a maiden in the ise, shrine, ise jingu shrine from memory I'm, I'm a little bit hazy now and then one day uh a guy called Yam, uh, yamato takeru okay who was considered to be well considered the 12th i think it was the 12th emperor of japan he was going eastwards towards yamato which is where i live basically it's in nara or around that area around nara kyoto area and his auntie or somebody who was the custodian at ise shrine said hey it's dangerous out there man you should take this sword with you and so he did and then there was this bandit this very bad group of uh, bandits who tried to kill yamato takeru when he was going eastward and the way they did this is when he was in a big grassy area they set it on fire and so the whole plane that he was in was on fire and the way that he saved himself was he used the sword that came from yamato orochi's uh tail and went up to heaven and then came back down again he used that sword to cut all the grass it was like a lawnmower the world's first lawnmower right <laughs> and and because of that all the grass gets cut and it can't burn right around him so he was saved and it was since that time that the sword became known as kusanagi no tsurugi or oh, the grass, that's like kusanagi ka. yeah the grass mowing sword and oh. since then even though the original was lost in 1185 in the battle of dan no ura between the minamoto and the taira in the genpei war um a replica I'm not supposed to say that but a replica has been created and it's been included in the imperial regalia and these are the three symbols of of imperial authority uh that are used they come out only 
uh, at an accession ceremony, uh, um, which happened last year, actually, didn't it? And um, when the emperor abdicated and his son became the new emperor. So the, it's like the crown jewels. Uh, the British monarchy has the crown jewels, which symbolizes their um, their royal or their monarchical authority. In Japan, they have the Sanshu uh, no Jingi, okay, the three mm. imperial regalia. So Kusanagi no Tsurugi is one of them. Yeah. Uh, there's the Magatama, yeah. which is a bead, and the mirror, the right. Kagami. And all of these things originally belonged, according to legends, to Amaterasu Omikami. And that is why the emperor today is considered to be connected with the kami, the gods, because of this uh, this continuation. Oh, why did I get that's onto a, that subject, Hiro? That's a really, really long... <laughs> Bloody hell, mate. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll be making all these videos for class, right? And so yeah, these are the kind of subjects I'll be talking about. That's great, though. Great, though. That's sorry about really that, man. Great, yeah, really uh, well, it sort of is related to Kendo in a way, though. Yeah, legend, way. legend of Japanese gods. Yeah, well, it, yeah. Sho it shows how the sword throughout history in Japan has always been yeah. held uh, in high regard as, as not only a weapon of destruction, but as a symbol of authority yeah. and a symbol of rectitude and justice as well so in a way it is very much connected yeah and then i i heard that double edged sword like that you know it's more uh sacred so that's why it says katsunin ken rather than katsunin to for something like that yeah yeah, yeah. i don't well, know well it's yeah, it's, it's basically what, what I've been talking about, and it's yeah. like it, it's, it's really special. It is kind of semantics in a way, but you've got to remember when swords first came to Japan um, around about second, third, fourth, fifth century. I can't remember. Yeah. Maybe fifth or sixth century when they first came to Japan from China through Korea. Um, Japan was not yet in the Iron Age, all right? And so when these metal objects came from uh china it's like oh my god look at this this shiny hard thing it's beautiful and and they were considered to be magical objects right and which is why when swords first arrived in japan they were not used as weapons they were used as uh tools in religious ceremonies um and so uh and the first swords that came in were double-edged swords or tsurugi, right? And it wasn't until about the 10th century that Japan started making its own swords right. with its own uh, peculiar style, and they became what we call now nihonto, okay, Japanese swords with a curve and the single-edged blade. But traditionally, swords were not so much weapons as more uh, symbols of uh, authority and magic as well sure also i don't know if you, we want to s <laughs> there you go <laughs> i've also heard here and there the term satsujinken along with katsujinken uh no satsujinken in the uh context of heiho kadensho and the sort of the, the philosophical underpinnings of kendo that we've just been talking about satsujin ken is not really a thing yeah, uh, there might be some obscure teaching somewhere in some school about it uh but it's really more of a play on the the more orthodox way of interpreting it it's a good show <laughs> all right so any other questions you can you see anything there Oh, that was a great, great lecture from Sensei, isn't it? Alex Sensei. You know, even uh, you, we learned about Japanese very, uh, what do you call it? Legend? No, no. Myth, mythology. Yeah, well, myths and legends, it's, it's called me. Shinwa. Shinwa, yeah. Mm.
I have a question. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. Meanwhile, I'm going to show sure says thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Shaw. Sure. Meanwhile, uh, uh, what can someone do to become what? I don't know, just. Hmm. What can someone do to become more intimate with and develop hara? Drinking beer is always a good start. <laughs> <laughs> um, ah, that, again, that's, that's a question that can be answered on many, many different levels. Um, where to start? Uh, gosh, it depends what you mean by develop hara as well. Um, can you elaborate a little bit what you mean by develop hara? Yeah, he already answered one way, <laughs> drinking <laughs> a lot of beer <laughs> to start with. Yeah, no question about that one, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, in any case, well, um, I'll just I'll just go ahead and and anticipate uh sort of what you mean by that uh i remember hero yep remember when we were we were training at the shubukan dojo uh mm. which is in itami uh near near osaka in japan that's where uh hero comes from and that's where i first met hero i think it was 1989 long time ago yeah, I bloody was, long time ago, eh? I was high school student. Yeah, yeah, 1989, 1990, it's around that time. And and at the Shubukan, there was a sensei called Tsurumaru Sensei. And Tsurumaru Sensei was a ninth dan. He became a ninth dan. So he was a, like a really famous sensei throughout Japan. And and Hiro and I were very lucky that we were able to to study under uh, such a, an incredible old, old geezer. He was like really big for his age too, wasn't he? He was yeah. a really tall guy. Um, when he was younger, he would have been an absolute monster. Um, because <laughs> he was an absolute monster when he was older too. Yeah, yeah he was, mate. He was a. It, it was a. It was tough, man. Yeah. It was tough. But every time after training, uh, where we train at the Shubukan Dojo, there's also an area uh, where you have a bath. Uh, it's a communal oh. bath, okay? And so when everybody's finished, they go in there and they they rinse themselves off and they jump in the hot water. And there's always a there was always a race to see who could be the first person to get the towel so that they could scrub the sensei's back, okay? And it, it sounds a bit weird these days, but in those days it's like this was your chance to go in there yeah. and scrub the sensei's back. And while you're scrubbing his back uh, because his hands couldn't quite reach. Okay. <laughs> that's when he would give you some really cool piece of advice. Um, don't ever see or hear anything like that in Kendo these days, but in those days it was like, this was, this was a great honor. It's just like folding the sensei's hakama while you're doing that. They'll, they'll give you some, some advice. Right? So when I was uh, scrubbing Tsurumaru sensei's back one day, he said to me, what do you think of my stomach? <laughs> it's like, wow um <laughs> and i swear to god uh you know you'll be able to back me up it was like he's a big guy his chest is there and his stomach comes out oh, yeah. like that hang on can i get in the picture it comes out it comes out like that and then down and i won't go any further than that but it's like the stomach <laughs> was like out like that and he wasn't a fat guy at all he wasn't fat it was very you know he's re relatively lean quite muscular except right. his stomach was like a little buddha's stomach wasn't it right and it's like yeah what am i supposed to say to that you know it's obviously not beer um because it's a well-defined pot mm -hmm. and he said Kore ga hara da yo. he said this is this is what hara is 
And I never really understood what he meant by that. But gradually after, you know, years of training, obviously that image has been burned into my brain. <laughs> and I've always, yeah, I've always sort of wondered what the hell was that all about? And basically is, is what he's talking about is all of his techniques, all of his movement, all of the pressure that he's applying on his opponent is emanating from this central sort of, I guess you could call it a reactor, a core reactor. Um, and he's pushing forward with that. So there is no, there is no uh, bure, what do you call bure in English? There's no, um, there's no shaking. There's no hesitation. Wobbling. It's just core, it's just, stable. Just a, like, like a wrecking ball, like a wrecking ball that's coming at you, right? And how he got his wrecking ball in that position, it's not as if you do lots of sit-ups and then suddenly you get, <laughs> you, yeah. get a, you get a wrecking ball. It's what he told me, and I didn't understand it at the time. And to be honest, even now, it's very difficult to sort of to work out. But he says because every training that he does, everything he has is focused in here. So when we're doing kendo, they tell you to relax your shoulders. What they mean is, I mean, it's really hard to relax your shoulders because you're because you're engaged in a really hardcore physical activity. You've got to use strength. Strength has got to come from somewhere. So when they say relax your shoulders, what does that mean? Well, what it actually means is take all of the strength out of your shoulders, take all the strength out of your arms and put it down into your reactor, put it down into your ball. Not that ball, um, <laughs> the wrecking ball on wow. your stomach, and focus everything there. So, as a result of that, gradually all of your breathing as well, it comes from not from your lungs, although it does physiologically, of course. But the image that you're having, it's all coming from the hara, and out here. So all of the power, you can feel it. All of the power is pressed into your gut, and as a result of that. I'm assuming this is what Sensei was telling me. Uh, his stomach developed, uh, or his hara, not his stomach, his hara developed uh, because everything was being forced, pushed into that and pushing out of that. And so how do you develop that? Well, just, just one more thing related to that. What I mean by there's so many levels to this hara question was I remember when I set my rokudan examination uh quite a few years ago the first time the first time that i set the examination i actually failed it and i i didn't feel good at the at the shinsa it just didn't feel right i was out of sorts um just uh, 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 indecisive blah 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 and inoue sensei he came up to me and said do you know why you failed and i said Nah, it just didn't feel good. And he goes, "Hara ga dekite nai." It's because mm. you're, you didn't have you didn't have hara. And it's like, sensei, <laughs> look at this hara, man. What are you talking about? And he goes, "Sono hara jana." It's not that hara. He's saying your hara, your hara is basically your composure, your confidence. So when I was out there, I was just like, ooh. Ooh, should I, shouldn't I, what should I do? Indecisive, because my wrecking ball down here, if you, if, not that I've got one that as good as, as it was, <laughs> my wrecking ball was sort of like, more like a balloon. And it was kind of soft and a little bit weak. And if I go in, it's going to pop. And I, I didn't want that. So it's, it's like, I didn't have conviction. So when you say the term used in Japanese, hara ga dekite nai, you don't have hara, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't, uh, you don't have a big stomach. It, it, can, it can mean that you don't have the guts. You don't have the, com the confidence or the conviction to do something. Yeah, no, so when you do have hara, okay, that means that come what may, you're just going to go through and you're going you're gonna to take it. Um, and you're not afraid of the result. Once you have made that commitment, you will follow through. And so as a result of having that kind of attitude in your, in your kendo, in your training, maybe 
that's what causes that physiological change as well and makes your hara in the physical sense also very pronounced and very powerful um, and there you have the connection uh, between shin gi tai or the the mind or the heart technique and body and they become as one you can't have one without the other okay so how do you develop or how do you come more intimate with and develop hara i think you've got to try like simple things like something i've been doing for the last few years um is i've been uh doing a lot of meditation um and uh when i'm meditating i'm imagining that i'm breathing and everything is being focused and centered in my in my stomach a lot of it's using your imagination or your mind it's kind of like image training but really learning how to focus everything down here rather than up here or here or, or other places and at the same time really uh relaxing and taking away all of the extraneous sort of physical strength and other parts of your body and trying to focus it down there is one way that you can become more intimate with your hara and perhaps that uh, it's not it doesn't come overnight i mean it's not something that suddenly it happens but it, it takes time but you really have to sort of uh, direct your thought you have to direct your mind uh, into that into that area and then somehow translate that into how you do your kendo as well so cool. it's a difficult question yeah it is it is and then the one one thing what i've been working on is when i try to relax my you know, when I try to have a good posture and I have shoulder problems, I have to get the shoulders down. But if I keep the po posture like this, my shoulder, it looks like, you know, I have a good posture, but it still have tension here mm. like this. So what I'm trying to do is like a ball, make, the, imagine this ball, oh, let me just hide this. Imagine this ball, make it smaller. And then all the tension goes away. It works for me. I don't know if it works for anyone else. But actually, this is called Chu Tanden as well. So Tanden, Chu Tanden, and Jo Tanden. But anyway, so probably everything, whatever Alex Sensei says, is kind of makes sense. All have to go down, relax, short chest, like make it smaller. It goes all the tension goes down. So whatever works, so uh, meditation, but good posture doesn't mean like this too. So uh, if you're doing this, probably that doesn't help to get the off, the, you know, to relax your body. So just go and relax, literally. Well, that's what she's in tai is, isn't it? If yeah. You know, the natural, is. natural standing position. Right. So mm. a good posture, go, mm, this is wrong to start with. So yeah. that's kind of have to, you have to rethink yeah. what's um, good it's like, like I've, I've never been in the army, but when you stand at attention, right, you really yeah. puff yourself out and make yourself ramrod straight. Okay. Um, this is not ideal at all. Right. Okay, in, in terms of budo, because you want to have that same feeling in your gut, but the rest right. of you has got to be really fluid, ready to move at any time. So if you're too rigid like this, um, then uh, again, this is like, this is moving what you need to have in your hara away from, from your hara, in, term, in, in the budo sense at least, right, or kendo sense. Right, right. So it's, it's very hard to grasp i think you know, for a lot of people but at least you know the theory and so uh now you can kind of start working on to get there the process is totally up to you but we can give you you know this way and that way but you know you have to find your way maybe something works something something that works for us doesn't mean it works for you so anyway so it's been one hour uh if you uh want to pick one more question brother alex uh what questions are there my man uh so probably i'm the one only who can see this i think <laughs> uh okay oh this one probably you have to uh promote your patreon too brother oh yeah um 
So someone asked when he can get uh, this one, I think. Uh, this one. Thanks, Olin. No Facebook, no Facebook users to get the link to your ha ah. so this is it this is another way yep so you you advertise your yeah your, absolutely on the patreon absolutely yeah so yep. this is one way so everyone who knows about patreon that uh you can go to patreon.com slash i think kindle world slash kindle world well just Let do a search in there for kindle world <laughs> <I guess. laughs> yeah it's the easiest patreon. Yeah, and you can be a, a member with of uh, Kindle World, and so if you become a, a Patreon, which means like financial supporters, so you, you can be a Patreon uh, to you know, Kindle World, so they can create uh, Kindle contents or other contents, Naginata contents or Kindle. Yeah, it's not, it's not only for creating hara with with right. beer. <laughs> <laughs> that include, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, so you, <laughs> but not for a long time. <laughs> so you can be a Patreon at the uh, uh, with Kindle World, and if you uh, become Kindle World's Patreon, consider to be a Patreon of a Kindle Guide as well. <laughs> very good idea. We need the support at the moment, I and mean, especially we do. now. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure, yeah, man. It's yeah. very hard to keep going without you guys without supports from you guys <laughs> all right so uh any any other questions i mean, i can go i think uh kindle conception there you go. Hmm. um Oh, the well, in, in, the theoretically, yeah, yeah. theoretically, it's exactly the same. Mm. Theoretically, it's exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is in Kendo, you have an opponent. In Iaido, you have an imaginary opponent. But the theory, um, in terms of it, is still part of the the realm of, of swordsmanship or traditional Japanese swordsmanship is, is exactly the same. Right, and probably uh, to we're gonna f probably he has to go to bed because we have a morning session, right? <laughs> I do indeed. Yeah, and so everyone tomorrow, not tomorrow, tomorrow morning for uh, Japan, you know that uh, what do you call it? time zone? Mm -hmm. uh, Six a.m. Your time? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what, Hiro? I will. I can post the link here. Hang on a sec. Just let me get it. Has he gone? Has he been gone? Oh, hey, he's gone. Let me get it, and he's gone. <laughs> Where did he go? Is he out? <laughs> oh, only me. Hi, guys. It's only me now. All right, so if you want to know the schedule uh, of Kindle uh, World, I have to get him back here, but if you want to... Um, I might, okay, so I made this uh, schedule for. Oh, we go. I'm gonna let him in. Hang on a minute, bro. Here we go. Yep. Yes. Welcome back. <laughs> here it is. Here. Um. Yeah. Can you can you see that? Hmm? What What do you want me to do? I just sent uh, to you oh, a you private did? chat. Okay. Um. The link uh, for oh, uh, Kenda will thing tomorrow. So if anybody wants it, can you show everybody what the link is? Yeah. There you go. So this is the link. I just it should be in the comment area, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the uh, Kindle World Virtual Keiko, uh, May 7th. That's Jap Japanese time, 7 a.m. At 6 p.m. if you're living in the Eastern uh, Standard Time Zone, uh, which is uh, us. So 6 p.m. today. So if you can uh, join that, that'll be great. I'm planning to be there. I don't, yeah, tomorrow I'll have a YouTube video live with Blake Bennett, same thing, tomorrow. So I'll be 
<laughs> what do you want to talk to him for? <laughs> Boy, he, he did a good job, bro. Oh, it's 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 cool. It's my bro. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So if you know about the schedule, I think pretty much I nailed uh, Kindle Kindle World session here too. This is the link you can click, so you can get the their schedule. Maybe a little bit different, but Eastern Time Standard, uh, Eastern Standard Time, and this is the t uh, today's Keiko uh, link. So if you have time or for your work, if you make time, we can get together tonight. All right. So that is it for today. I think it's very successful again, and uh, thank you guys for coming and. I hope I don't have work next week, but probably it <laughs> looks like I have to go back to work. Oh, no. Uh, I know. Uh, I probably have to tell them I have to work from home. I have asthma. So <laughs> I'm going to play the asthma card. <laughs> so I can, uh, we can do this again, hopefully, cross, fingers crossed. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, thanks so, very much, at all, as always. Thank you. Thank you very much. It uh okay see you guys later and thanks very much brother alex again to be with us and hopefully we can get together next week too yeah thanks for great questions it was really good fun cheers yeah thank you guys all right bye bye okay <laughs> <laughs>